Okay, quick uh, test of the audio. Give us a thumbs up if you can hear. Okay, we've got at least one or two thumbs up. That's good enough for me. Excellent. And you can see the screen has changed. Thumbs up if you can see the screen has changed from before. Adam's given me a thumbs up. Tomo, nice to see you. You've given me a thumbs up as well. We have, um, let's see how many people we've got online at the moment. We have just hit, uh, I don't even know what time it is, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, but we've just hit the start time, let's say. And that means that we should uh, we should get moving. So let's just rearrange some of this on my desktop so that I can see everything where I need it to be. And uh, welcome everybody to our webinar this morning or evening, uh, depending where you are joining us from. Uh, we're thrilled to have received uh, 101 registrations from people uh, from more than 40 different countries. We had a target of getting 100 people. We thought this is going to be something that is interesting to people. We thought we'd like to get 100 people registered. And um, overnight, we hit our 101th, if that's a word. So thank you very much and welcome. I think it's fair to say that uh, COVID has impacted all of our lives uh, this year. Um, and, and let me just give you an example of that. This was, this was me in April of 2020, just as we were launching our online education programs. And this is me yesterday. Uh, yes, am I changed forever thanks to COVID? Well, we are yet to see, um, but I think it's a great way to start the conversation today because um, running a chess tournament in 2020 is a much hairier experience for all of us than it was pre-COVID. So it, it's nerve wracking for me because so much of it is out of control. It's out of our control. Um, and that's certainly not what an arbiter or a tournament organizer is comfortable with. So when I'm running an online tournament, I'm always worried, will this player be able to sign in properly? Will their permissions be right? You know, can they even remember their own email address? All right, will the platform be working? Will the platform stay online? Will the server crash? You know, or maybe I wouldn't even put it past 2020 with the whole internet crash and, and leave us stranded. And of course, then there's the players themselves. Once they're playing their games, will they be playing fairly? All right, and that's what we're here to talk about today. How do we ensure fair play in all of our online chess tournaments? All right, so just a quick overview uh, of the webinar and what we're going to be covering over the next uh, hour and a half um, to two hours. So the schedule is a two hour schedule. Hopefully it's about an hour and a half of kind of presentations and then we get some time for questions at the end. Now, I, I have a pet peeve, which is webinars that make you wait until the last five minutes to give you all the really good stuff. And they're like the secrets of, you know, making a great, uh, you know, Caesar salad or something. And then they don't tell you to put the bacon until right at the end. It's like, well, just tell us that at the start. I want to know the good bits. So um, I just want to give this away right at the start on a single slide, the entire webinar. Okay, so this is pretty much what we're talking about today. We're talking about ensuring fair play in your events online. And in order to do that, you need three things. No one thing is enough. You need an environment that supports fair play. You need supervision of the games that are in progress. And you need to do some verification that the games were in fact played fairly and your first two strategies were working. All right, so that's it. You guys can go. Thank you very much. It's been nice to see you. Uh, if you want to, you can leave now. You've got everything you need. All right, but if you want to stick around, um, this is what's going to happen. First, I'm going to try and unpack some of the behavioral psychology around cheating in chess. Like, why does it happen? What our goals should be as organizers and arbiters? And how we can change our thinking about cheating, cheaters, and the consequences of, of cheating. I'm then going to introduce you to uh, Adam Roof, who from England, who's going to discuss the online chess tournament environment and how the environment impacts fair play. After Adam's presentation, we're going to cut across to uh, Eugenia Prokopova, in the Czech Republic, who's going to share some of her experiences uh, with online events. And she's going to comment on the supervision of players during online events. I'll then take the spotlight back and walk you through some of the options that we have available to us today for the verification of fair play. There's some of this statistical analysis that is available. And I'm going to try and give just some practical insights into how to read and interpret that data which is available 
because um, I'm guessing not everybody has a degree in statistics. And then finally, once we've covered off that, I'm going to throw the floor open to questions and we'll take as many questions as we can get through uh, before, before the session finishes. So if along the way you think of something uh, that you would like to ask or share, um, the chat is open. So feel free to type in the chat um, and ask a question. Let us know what, uh, what you're thinking. Um, share, share a comment or a question. And the, the people who are not actually doing the talking will uh, we'll, we'll, um, monitor that chat and they'll feed the questions through to the presenters uh, who, are, who are actually going to focus, I guess, more on, uh, on, on, their, on the conversation. All right, so uh, let's, let's get started. Firstly, let me introduce myself. My name is David Cordova. I'm the founder and CEO of Tornello. And I just want to give you my chess resume here. So in 1996, I was the Australian junior chess champion. Shortly thereafter, I started a scholastic coaching business in Melbourne, Australia called Chess Kids. We built that business up over the years to about 5,000 students a semester, 20,000 per year. Um, and we had over 100 coaches working for us uh, through about 600 schools. In 2002, I started and have been running since then an inter-school series of competitions with local events, state events, and then a national event. And, and that will attract somewhere close to 10,000 entries per year in the scholastic space. I owned and ran a retail chess shop from 1999 until today. Obviously today it's e-commerce only and not uh, an actual store anymore. Um, and in 2008, I started building uh, this platform called Tornello. It was a web-based platform to manage the full life cycle of a chess event, collecting registrations, managing the tournament on the day, you know, pairings and organizing the event, and then publishing, uh, updating results, profiles, and ratings. And that was built out of the, just the sheer volume of tournaments that I was running and the need to kind of automate a lot of the work that, that I had. Um, that that uh, project was shelved in 2012. We still kept using it through 2012 to 2020, but we didn't do significant development work on that project. But in March 2020, COVID hit the world and over the board chess was forced online. Um, and we looked at a number of the options available to us uh, and we decided that it was actually going to be better to build our own online game server into Tornello so that we could facilitate our vision of uh, the organization of arbiter-led scheduled chess tournaments. Right? And these are some key words that I'm using. There are some fantastic on-demand chess platforms out there. But my, my view was that the fundamental structure of those platforms wasn't going to let me create the same quality of experience that players would get in an over-the-board event. And so Tornello set out to recreate as best we could the over-the-board experience, but with the convenience of online play. Right? And we're pretty excited by some of these hybrid events that are now springing up, which give us exactly that give us the experience of over the board, but the convenience of online. So I'm just going to take uh, this, this 30 seconds to, um, you know, I guess toot our own horn a little bit uh, and announce um, for the first time publicly that uh, after successfully hosting the European Chess Union's European Youth Championships a month ago, FIDE has selected Tornello as the platform for the upcoming World Youth and Cadets Championships, which will be running continental qualifiers and then a world championships, and the online Olympiad for players with a disability. So I'm pretty excited by, uh, by, by that selection. And um, we, were, we were given permission to announce that by FIDE yesterday. So here it is, it's announced, uh, excellent. And, and if people are interested, I will um, talk a little bit more about uh, Tornello uh, at the end. So the first, uh, the first thing I want to try and do is just ask everybody a question. And that question is, what is the first rule of chess? What is the first rule of chess? <clears throat> now, people usually write rules in order. You know, the most important one is first. So you can just, you should see a, a poll on your screen. You can just kind of click A, B, C, or D. You know, what, what is the most important thing uh, when, when you're playing a game of chess? Mm. So we've got a few... Varied answers. Okay, great. Looks like we've got some arbiters in the room because we're getting uh, a lot of these, uh, I won't say right, but uh, I'll tell you what, what the 
official FIDO rules are. We've got a bunch of those. So let's just quickly show you. Half the people suggested that chess was a two-player game. Some saying that White should move first and some players saying, well, don't cheat. Okay, so what does FIDO say? The very first rule of chess, FIDO laws of chess 1.1, the game of chess is played between two opponents. All right, FIDO doesn't even bother to mention, uh, you know, don't use a computer to help you until rule 11.3, where they say that you're forbidden to use any sources of information or advice. Um, but I just want uh, us to think for a moment about this rule number one, the game of chess is played between two opponents. And there are lots of different ways to cheat in chess. You know, position your opponent with the sun in their eyes, kick them under the table, you know, blow smoke in their face. You know, there was a great book about how to cheat in chess. Uh, and some of those are fantastic, but we're not worried really about any of those things at the moment because there is one massive elephant, which is just dwarfs all other forms of cheating at the moment. And that is the ability to use assistance, right? And particularly computer assistance. We don't even care if they get their you know, grandmother to help them. It's not gonna do that much. The key is computer assistance. So um, I want us to start off by thinking about us. Before we go out in the world and try and make change in other people, we have to look at ourselves, right? And I, can, I think this is relevant in, in any situation that you try and make some sort of change, right? So let's think about ourselves and about how the fact that we are arbiters and organizers and we truly believe in the rules and that's our kind of life's work is to, is to follow these rules of chess. And yet here we have a, a situation where people are breaking the very first rule of chess, right? The very first rule. So it is fundamentally uh, difficult for us as arbiters and organizers. It is fundamentally extremely emotionally challenging um, to, 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 to us. And I think that we often get a little bit, um, you know, we often react in a very emotional way as well. And sometimes the reactions that we have to this, uh, to this, uh, you know, pandemic that we're having at the moment is, um, is actually detrimental to the, the long-term uh, objectives that we should, be, should we, we should be staying for. So I just want to spend a little bit of time thinking about us and what we can do ourselves in the first place before we look at what we can do to others. Uh, I think that's uh, just kind of a, a good uh, change management strategy in all situations. So firstly, uh, the language that we can use. So John Stuart Mill said that the language is the light of the mind. Whatever you, whatever language you use, that shines a light on uh, parts of the brain that, that tells the brain how to light up, all right? It tells it kind of what to think in some ways. So I think it's really important that we start changing the language that we're using in this, in this, uh, you know, in this environment. I, I really wanna try and put it into a more positive direction. I want people to start thinking about what we want them to do, not what we don't want them to do because the human brain just does not process negatives very well. If I say to you, hey, whatever you do, don't, do not, don't think of a pink elephant. The first thing that pops in your mind is a pink elephant. You just, it's impossible to do anything else because we've said the words and the words shine light on the brain, right? So once it's in there, the subconscious takes over and starts kind of following some of these instructions, right? And you might be giving that subconscious mind of all of your participants and all of your chess community, the wrong instructions, because you're saying, we're looking at cheating. We don't want any cheating, right? Don't talk about cheating, speak about fair play, right? Let's flip this around and let's talk about what we want to happen, what we want to see happening, right? This is what you would do in any, uh, you know, in, in any psychological situation. This is what you do in any learning situation. This is no different, right? We don't want to be out there talking about the, the negative. We want to talk about how we want things to, to see. So some of the language that I like to use is fair play instead of cheating. Unfair insistence, all right? Unfair assistance, because it frames it nicely. It's like, well, that's unfair, right? And so people go, oh, okay, it was unfair assistance as opposed to using a computer. Right? We're using a computer, that's okay. We do that all the time. All right? So um, poor choices or bad decisions, not cheating bastard, right? But you know, frame it in the right way. This is, this is a choice that people have. And sometimes people make bad decisions. All right? It's a teachable moment when you catch them. It's not a hanging offense, all right? It's a teachable moment. It's, it's about learning, right? Not about punishing. It's about building trust in the community 
and protecting good performances. All right. So when we talk about supervision later on, uh, you know, I do this in, in we run, remember a lot of kids tournaments. Okay. We're running, you know, two, three kids tournaments a day. And, and I um, will have very low level of supervision in those tournaments, but if there are people who are looking a bit suspicious, I wanna actually investigate them a bit more and we wanna put them on camera and share their screen and all those sorts of things. And so what I do is I say to the kids before the tournament starts, you know, anybody who plays really, really well today, if you can like outperform your rating, I'm gonna select you to go on the screen, on camera, to share your screen, and we're gonna watch your game really closely, right? It's a prize, congratulations. You are going, you, you want to work towards that. You want to be one of those five or 10 people who get selected for deeper scrutiny, right? Because we're trying to protect your good performance. If you play really well, if you play out of your skin, then we want you to feel like everybody's giving you positive energy, positive emotions, positive vibes. We don't want people to be suspicious of you. And so we're, going to, we're doing this for your own good, for your own protection, to protect good performances. All right, and that all of a sudden changes the entire atmosphere of the event. The kids are like, oh, I hope I get picked, right? But nobody's out there going, well, I better find stockfish so I can get picked to be on, you know, on camera, right? Because they know, you know that this is about ensuring fair play. They know, because we've talked about this. All right, so the language that we use, uh, really important. I would like to, I would like to really you know, try and encourage everybody to, to focus on, on, on that language side of things if you can. And it's difficult because you get in these habits. We've had six months of habits talking in a very negative way. Uh, and I think the negative emotions it, it, and the, the, the negative, exp, you know, it turns to the experience that the players are, are actually having. So what should our goal be? As tournament organizers and as arbiters, like why are we doing this? Okay, why are we even in this seminar? Why are we even thinking about, uh, thinking about this? And, and I would say that at every moment, you are either building trust or you're destroying it. And your goal should be one simple thing. That is to provide a positive experience or a good experience for your players. Right? Like this is fundamentally why we're running chess tournaments, right? If we run a tournament and everybody has a negative experience, nobody comes back next time. And in six months or in a year, chess is gone. It's finished. You know, everybody just goes and plays their on-demand chess on a, on a platform, but they don't need to play any tournament games anymore because they've lost trust in the whole system. Right? Every experience they have is negative. You know, back in uh, when I was playing competitive chess, my favorite thing of all was to be playing in a, in a tournament to be a lower seed and to beat somebody two or three or 400 points higher rated than me. Right? I remember beating my first international master. I'm like, yes, how awesome is this? I beat an IM. Right? Today, we live in a, in a situation where it is very difficult for the players to get that positive experience, to that, get that joy of beating an international master when everybody looks at them and goes, but did you really? Or was that Stockfish that beat the IM? Like, did you cheat? Maybe something went on. Let's investigate. Let's dig in. Let's, let's, you know, let's really question your capabilities. Uh, and this is a horrible, horrible experience for people, right? And um, the same thing applies when, you, when you're a, a player who wins a game. You know, people are going to be questioning you and suspicious of you, right? If you lose a game, then you're going to be doing, you're going to be suspicious of the other person. So like who wants to live in a world where there's fear and suspicion all around? So our fundamental goal has to be to create a good experience, a positive experience for people. So they want to come back. So they want to play chess again. So they want to play chess more often, right? And to build that positive experience, we have to build communities of players that trust one another, right? Well, that's, that's absolutely key. We've got to build trust. Now in, in no, um, in no police forces in the world, in no criminal justice system, systems in the world, do they set out with the objective to eradicate crime, right? Firstly, it's just not really realistic. You can't eliminate all crime, but you can build a society where people feel safe, secure, happy, and there are deterrents. There will always be a small percentage of the population who are going to try to commit crimes. And there'll be an even smaller percentage of people who in the, in the population commit crimes and get away with it, right? And 
we have to accept that. That is, that is okay. What we can't allow is a society where it is driven by fear and by suspicion and people don't feel safe walking down the street, right? So we are, we are building you know, a, a peer group, a community of people who feel safe and secure and who trust the system. Once we've got that, if there's a little bit of you know, assistance going on, you know, we're going we're gonna to sort of have to accept that you can't catch it all, all the time. We're going to put as many mechanisms in place as we can. And we've already told you the three things that we're going to do to, 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 uh, you know, to prevent that. And we're going to eliminate as much as possible. But there's always going to be a new person coming into the system who doesn't know the culture. They don't get it. They haven't been there before. And so, you know, they're going to try something. All right. We're going we're to catch those people as much as we can. We're going to weed them out. And we're going to have the community itself, you know, be, 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 um, you know, a positive influence. If the community is a really healthy, vibrant, happy community, there's not going to be much crime, right? Because, because people who move into that community are going to be, uh, you know, aware of what's going on. So just quickly to touch on punishments, you know, what are the consequences of those actions? Okay, what are the consequences of those actions? Um, this is just some, some, some key, uh, you know, uh, what are called principles from the National Institute of Justice. And when I think about, uh, when I think about um, you know, this, this problem of, of fair play in chess, I, I, I try to look at other environments that have solved or are solving the same essential fundamental problem. So I'm looking at justice systems, criminal psychology, behavioral psychology. I'm looking at you know, online trolls and online bad behavior. I'm looking at all of these um, I'm looking at actually even um, obesity and why are people why are people you know um, becoming obese in in our in our generation and our society? You know it's 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 important to look at things where uh, you know where pe other people are solving similar types of issues. So the National Justice Institute, uh, the National Institute of Justice in the United States, s s says they've they've done lots of research that shows that the chance of being caught is more effective than the draconian punishments. So anybody who is out there talking about, you know, if you cheat once, if you cheat in one move, we're going to catch you and we're going to throw you out, and that's it. You're never going to be able to play chess again. We're going to take all your chess sets away. And, you know, we're going to we're going to we're going to tie your hands behind your back and we're going to we're going to brainwash you so you don't know, you know, can't remember the French defence anymore, right? Like. This, this, sort of, this sort of punishment, uh, this sort of lifelong bans uh, is, is not an effective deterrent, right? It is equally effective, right? And maybe even more effective just to increase the chance of being, being caught or to increase the perception of being caught, right? So just to have a policeman walking around the streets and people go, ah, oh, I see a policeman. Maybe I'm going to get caught. Maybe I shouldn't. Like just cycle sub, uh, subconsciously implanting ideas into people's minds. That is much more effective, right? Throwing somebody in jail isn't an effect, effective way to deter a crime. So once you've caught somebody cheating, right? Throwing that person under the bus isn't going to stop the next person from doing it, right? So we need to put me mechanisms, measures in place to stop people. Right? We don't want to catch everybody who cheats. If that was our goal, then we would want everybody to cheat. Right? Because our goal would be to catch people who cheated. And if no one cheated, we'd have no one to catch. Right? So don't set your goal up to be something which the only way you can fulfill it is to have a bunch of people cheating. Set up our goal. We want to establish an environment of fair play and trust. And then when everybody trusts one another and everyone's happy at the end of the tournament, you don't even have to worry about it. You're like, awesome. Everybody played, everyone was happy. Everyone had a great tournament. We all enjoyed it. Nobody was an overt cheater. Uh, you know, nobody's got any assistance. We're, we're, we're happy, right? You don't have to throw anybody in, in jail in order to prevent the crime, all right? Um, so it's, it's about perception and severity doesn't, doesn't really make a difference. So I, just again, I want to I say this. I've said this kind of a thousand times, but I want to kind of really harp on this and repeat. This is not a silver bullet. Right? We're not here today to tell you, here's the one thing you can do and nobody's ever going to cheat again. Right? There are no silver bullets in this situation. Right? We are building a community of players that have certain values and, and values development and community building takes time. All right? We need to work this as a process and over time we will get there. The process will be to weed out a few cheaters at a time, a few people at a time who are getting unfair assistance. It will be to forgive and to trust because when we trust the players 
even after they have been, um, even after they have been, you know, maybe caught and admitted that they have done the wrong thing, if we trust them again in the future, we are we are role modeling the behavior that we would like to see. So we are showing the players, you know, this is what you this is what you should this is what you should be doing. All right. So um, we're trying to create this peer group where the community itself is a huge influence on the uh, on the on the players. And I've got this uh, evolution of trust into visualization, which I'm going to share with people after the after the uh, after this session. All right, so I've got five minutes now to just kind of unpack a little bit about why people cheat. People, you know, I get this question, I get this question a lot, you know, what, what sort of cheating and why are people doing it? I think I break cheating down into kind of two big buckets. There's opportunistic cheating and there's malicious cheating and they are very different. So for 99.5% of chess events around the world, um, opportunistic cheating is the problem that you need to worry about. It's easy to do. So they do it, all right? And they can do it either in a flagrant way, that is they can copy every move of every game, or they can just do it occasionally. Well, they'll just check every now and then, all right? There are very few people who are in this second bucket, this malicious cheating, this deliberate repeated offenses. Uh, this, is the, this is the sort of cheating, this malicious cheating, which, which occurs when people are, uh, you know, there's a high stakes tournament. There's a world championship title on the line. There's a, a you know hundred thousand dollar prize money on the line. You know there are there are some serious like there are you know very very high stakes um, you know opportunities for gain, and people people will uh, you know it will cheat in that situation um, you know with with different different rationality. All right. So um, yeah, Evgeny, you're exactly right. People cheat because they can. So what is the motive? And I get this question a lot. You know, I'm, 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 I sort of say, okay, well, here's some evidence that shows a few people have cheated. And they'll say, but yeah, but why would they cheat? Like they're the top seed. Why would the top seed in a tournament use a computer to get assistance to beat people who are 500, 600, 1,000 points lower rated than them, right? And this is, this is a real, you know, this is real examples from real tournaments. We've had the top seeds who are getting assistance. You're like, but you were going to win anyway. What's the motive? You know, why are you doing this? Right. And this is this is really important to understand that there doesn't really need to be a motive, right? People just they they behave badly online anyway, right? We all know people behave much worse in real you know online than they do in real life. So straight away we've got this behavioural psychology that talks about uh, you know the anonymity aspect, you know that that um, you know. People feel like nobody knows who they are because you're sitting behind this this barrier, you know, this this screen which filters out reality and puts you into this uh, this disassociative state where you go like, oh yeah, I'm anonymous. Now I'm not talking about logically. I'm talking about subconsciously. You know, so people are put in this state where they are, you know, anonymous. They can't see the opponents. A lot of times you're playing in platforms where there is a username, not a real name. Uh, you know, they're playing. Uh, you know, behind a behind a camera, so maybe they can, maybe they can't see their opponents. Um, you know, they can do things, um, and there's no immediate consequence. So this is, you know, kind of more if you're if you're you know, looking at internet trolls or or kids doing silly things on the internet. You know, they there's no immediate consequence. It kind of applies in chess. You get assistance in one game. Maybe you don't hear about that until the end of the tournament, or the next day, or a week, or two weeks later, right? So the consequence and action are not directly correlated to one another in your subconscious. All right? It's like trying to tell a dog who's done the wrong thing, you know, and peed on the floor somewhere a week later, hey dog, you shouldn't pee on the floor. Like it doesn't link up anymore. It's too far apart. So, um, you know, this, this timing issue makes it very difficult. You know, the, the, um, the imagination, you know, this can come into play both for themselves as a player and, and their opponent. They can think, well, Actually, you know, that, that player probably, you know, got some assistance in the previous game and doesn't really deserve to be on four out of four. And so, like, if I play against them, I don't want that. Like, they're lower rated than me. They don't deserve to beat me. So I should just be using an engine just to check whether my opponent's getting assistance. All right? And then, of course, they end up using the engine for themselves to play the moves, right? And so, um, you know, this, this imaginary situation where they create these hypothetical situations which justify their bad behavior or kind of force them into a situation where the only possible thing to do is behave badly. Uh, and then this is a critical one, you know, this minimization of authority. You know, this is really critical. Um, 
you know, people don't see an authority figure, so they don't feel like they have to do anything, anything. they don't feel like they have to do the right thing. You know, the, the rules are far more removed. Um, and again, this is what I said, you know, before that, you know, in the, in the criminal justice world, in the criminal justice world, people, you know, put a photograph of a policeman on the front of their electronic store. And just the photograph of the policeman triggers people's subconscious so that when, everybody, when people walk in, you know, there is a far lower rate of, uh, you know, petty theft, of, of shoplifting. You know, these things work. It's, 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 it's pretty simple. Um, the reason that once, once you've got this sort of environment, which is difficult, we have to understand the psychology of the chess players. And there's this concept called psychosocial immaturity, right, which... Um, the, 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 the highest demographic, the most likely people to, uh, to, to get assistance, to make these bad decisions in online chess, are the, are the, the, the same people who have got this um, you know, biological, biological immaturity, right? So we're talking about teenagers and young adults. You know, I, I've seen you know, a lot of tournaments over the last few, few, few months and very, very few people under the age of 11 uh, are getting unfair assistance. But once that teenage years kicks in, you know, teenagers, they, are, they make choices on impulse. You know, they've got very low impulse control. You know, that, you know you're focusing on short-term gains instead of long-term gains. So it's, it's, you can't delay the gratification. You're like, well, I'm gonna get the win now. You know, who cares if I get caught and, and you know, the, my, my long-term reputation and you know, career and whatever else is, is damaged. You know, it's all about short-term gains, right? They're, they're susceptible to peer group pressure. So if you have a community of people who are, you know, a few of them are getting assistance, it breeds and more and more and more people get assistance. And, and you know, they just fail to anticipate consequences of action. Right. This psychosocial immaturity, it applies particularly to people in their teenage through to mid and, and late twenties. But, you know, anybody who, uh, you know, I, I think in general, our community, which is chess players, um, we find that, uh, you know, chess players probably have got a, a lower emotional intelligence and a higher intellectual, like a higher IQ and a lower, uh, you know, EQ than maybe the, the majority of the population. All right, or an average person. So it's going to be a little bit more difficult for people who are very intellectual, but maybe don't have the emotional intelligence and the empathy uh, for, for uh, you know, for other people. Um, it's going to be much more difficult for those people. So in general, I think, you know, this psychosocial maturity is, is hard for chess community. All right, it, it's also harder when we put people into tournament situations, that is an emotional situation. And if anyone thinks that a chess tournament's not emotional, you know, you've never played in a chess tournament. So, you know, we put ourselves under emotional pressure and, and it's going to be harder to make the right decisions. So just, you know, be understanding of the, of the, the players, be understanding of the environment that we're putting them in and the challenges that we are, we are giving them, right? If you've got a three-year-old or a four-year-old child and you put that child, you know, in a room with a bunch of candies and chocolates and chips and junk food and you say don't touch it i'll be back in an hour and you come back in an hour later they've eaten a bunch of it like you can't really get upset with them right they don't have the emotional maturity to to follow those instructions and to, it's the impulse control is just not there it is harder to do the right thing than it is to do the wrong thing and people will always take the path of least resistance and you can't really blame people for that right? Okay, people have to take responsibility for their actions, but we, we, shouldn't be, we shouldn't be putting players in a situation which is fundamentally difficult, right? And then complaining when five or 10% of people do the wrong thing, right? We need to be congratulating the 95% who do the right thing. We need to be improving the environment that they're playing in. And on that note, I'm going to pass over to international arbiter Adam Roof, who is, has been the arbiter at, at candidates matches, world championship matches. He's been the captain of the England Olympiad team. Uh, he's a coach, he's an arbiter. He's the editor of a chess newsletter and host of a podcast. Um, and he ha is going to be talking to us uh, about the environment of chess. So thank you, Adam, and welcome. Thanks very much, David. Um, hi, everyone, my name's Adam Ralph. Um, I'm an international arbiter and organiser. I'm one of these strange people who gets pleasure from seeing other people playing chess. 
Um, last year, I organized uh, about 5,000 games for people over the board. And since March, probably like the rest of you, I've organized none. So uh, once I got over the shock, I started to look at online platforms to try and transfer my events online. I tried all of the major platforms. Um, they're all excellent sites, but they're not designed with organizers or arbiters in mind, really. And they weren't going to change in response to the, the new challenges presented by the pandemic. Um, then I saw a post on Facebook and discovered Tornello. Um, my first approach was to try and recreate, clone my events, my over the board events, just take them and put them online. <clears throat> Until a player asked me, is that really what you want? He said, over the board events have so many issues, why carry those issues across to online tournaments? Uh, and then I realized that online chess had the potential to be your best chess experience. Now I'm organizing tournaments for all groups of people, um, junior tournaments, I'm organizing tournaments for the French Chess Federation and so on. So how does this fit into our topic of fair play? Well, I believe if you create a competitive environment based on integrity, community, honesty and trust, then the players will place a high value on your event. And my experience shows that people are far less likely to violate the fair play rules if they share those values and they have faith in the integrity of the tournament. I'm sure David would agree with that. So today I'm going to give you five ways to create a great environment online. I'm going to talk about being a good communicator, making the fair play system transparent, being present, thinking about your audience, and finally, something you can do which guarantees your players will get the best out of their online experience. So if you're a player rather than an organizer or an arbiter, then that section is for you. And if you have any questions, please drop them into the Zoom chat and I'll try and give you an honest answer in the question and answer session at the end. Okay, so number one is even before the event starts, you need to be a good communicator. Over the board events, maybe it's just in England, um, but over the board events are often very poor at this. There's no communication from the tournament organizers until you actually arrive in the playing hall, sit down to play your game, and then there's a half an hour speech before the round, when all you really wanna do is just play chess. So my advice to you is don't leave it until the start of your online event to communicate with your players. Set the tone early, hopefully friendly and open, and reassure your players who are gonna be anxious. I think we all know how that feels. You, you know, you've put your check in the post, or you've paid your money online, you haven't even got a receipt or an email to acknowledge that. So inform them clearly about what you expect from them. Don't leave it until the first round to make announcements. Um, and what, what I do and what I recommend that you do is to create um, a three-stage onboarding process with introductory emails. So the onboarding process is what a company would use to introduce new members of staff to their team, to their working environment, um, show them where they're sitting down on their computer, uh, what software they'll be using, offer them training opportunities, and use your three emails to do the same thing. So the first email is obviously the welcome email. Here are the details you've entered. You'd be surprised how many people don't do that. And people get anxious almost immediately. You know, what's happened? Have I entered this tournament? Who else is playing? Send, send them an email and if you can automate it, it's even better. Um, pretty soon after that, you need to send them information, which is, I like to think of it as a kind of frequently asked, questions email. So you're telling your entrants how you'll be running the event. Usually they'll be using Tornello for the first time. In the UK, definitely for the first time. They won't know what to do. 
they'll be uncomfortable with the idea of using it for the first time. They may not have used Zoom. So you need to send them a link, for instance, to um, a YouTube video that shows them how to do it, or a very useful video from Tonello showing them how to use Tonello. Think about those ideas, put those in the chat, let me know afterwards, what would you send them? My top tip, which I think players really appreciate, is offer them something like a free practice event. So if you were setting up an event from scratch, you would test the software. Think about your players and offer them a practice event where they can, before the main tournament starts, they can use Tornello and Zoom uh, without any pressure, set the tone for the event. You can have a play with a chat. They can talk to you about anything they're worried about. They can set up their screen without any kind of pressure of being in a real tournament. And the third email that you need to send your players is probably the night before the event. Send them a final email saying, you know, we're looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Here's what you need to remember. Here's what, what time we're starting. Here's how to take a bye if you need one, if you can't, suddenly can't make the first round. All those things. It will definitely improve their experience of playing in your tournament. The second thing is be transparent. Okay, so be transparent about the fair play software. Make it clear to the participants in your tournament that the, the fair play software is there. Don't be opaque like a lot of platforms are. Tell them it's there, tell them how it works. Maybe give them a link to an article explaining how it works. Um, this is really because what we want to do is we want to gently make players aware that the fair play system is working in the background to protect them. It's not about the fair play software monitoring their games. Okay, so they're not under the spotlight. We want to make them aware, but not paranoid. So use the right kind of language, as David said. Use the phrase, Tornello delivers the information about the games to your arbiters in real time to protect you. It is much better than saying, we're watching you at every stage of your game. Send them a link to the Tornello blog, which um, David will probably put in the chat. And then they can read about the software in detail and at their leisure. Uh, over the board, players usually report their concerns to the arbiter. And Jirina will talk about how that works in face-to-face -face events and how you can transfer those skills online. But the same thing is true online. You need to be able to show the players how they can use the software to communicate with the arbiter if they have any issues, in confidence. For instance, if uh, their opponent has disappeared from the camera or is looking down something that looks suspicious, they, they're worried that they might be using a phone, they can report that to the arbiter. You need to be able to quickly allay their concerns at least. Um, the other thing I found quite useful is in transparency terms is ask for feedback from your players. So after the event is finished, you can design a form on JotForm um, or something similar to just ask the players, you know, how did you find this event? Have you got any comments? How did you find particular aspects of the event? Was it easy to use Tornello? What could we do to improve the event? And a lot of the things I've got to tell you about have been passed on to me by players themselves because their experience of using Tornello and Zoom has been good but they found ways to improve it which is point number five. So third point be be present okay this isn't about meditation it's about having an arbiter present and constantly supervising any event. So you know, in over, over the board chess, the arbiter is often absent or remote. They might be in a separate room. Maybe you've had this experience yourself. I played in tournaments where nobody could find the arbiters because their room was down the corridor and up some stairs, and that's where they spent most of the tournament. So think about that. If you're running a tournament and you're on Zoom, is it obvious who the arbiter is? Sometimes it's really obvious if it's a junior tournament and you're the only adult present. But in a mixed tournament, 
how do you know who the arbitrary is? When you look at the Zoom call and you have 100 people, how can you tell? Have you introduced yourself? It could be as obvious as that. My top tip is you should always choose a profile picture with your head and shoulders so that even when you're not on the camera, people know you're there. And make sure that you change your screen name to your name and in brackets, arbiter, maybe in capital letters. Okay, so that people will see your smiling face watching over them like a good shepherd. I know that when um, David does a Zoom call, he always uses his Tornello branded background and Jurina has the same background. When I'm running a tournament online, I like to wear branded Chess England clothing, um, the same black t-shirt with the same logo, just so that it stands out and it's consistent for the viewers. And when I switch the camera off, it's the same picture, just I don't move much. So that's one thing that will create a good atmosphere for your, your players. They need to know who you are and they need to know that you're, you're there. Um, it's the same as being in an exam and having an invigilator. And I've done a lot of invigilating exams and simply being there in the same room does allay a lot of fears and it prevents people who might be tempted to um, break the rules. And also they can call on you whenever they need help. The fourth thing is remember that you have an audience. They're your audience, but they're also playing chess in front of an audience on camera for the first time, usually. And that can make them uncomfortable and anxious. Um, some of us this evening are not on camera for that reason. I mean, it's just human nature. You need to find a way to make your players, um, to reassure them, to try and encourage them to focus on the game and not that environment. Um, they are playing under their real names and you can see their video feed on the screen, which is a great thing. Um, it creates an atmosphere more like a real over the board tournament where you, you, know, you play a good move and then you just check your opponent's expression to see whether or not they like the move or they hate the move. What, what's, what's their reaction? You know who they are. You might have played them before in a tournament. Um, you might know them personally. It makes them a real person to you in that environment but it takes getting used to being on camera all the time um, as organizers you should be using the zoom tools to your advantage you should be practicing um, using zoom so i've been running a lot of online quizzes on zoom and i discovered i could use the breakout rooms to create separate rooms for quiz teams and now i'm trying to create those same breakout rooms in chess tournaments for analysis and chat but fundamentally you have to learn how to mute all the players just to make sure that nobody disturbs the play, preserve your playing environment. Um, and I have to remember to mute myself because I'm often the one who disturbs everybody. Um, remember to make the chat in Zoom private between you and the players. That's really important during play especially. That's an option in the chat. Make the chat private so that when the, chat, when the player chats to you, you're the only person who can see it and they can say what they like to you. And that's important because quite often a player will say something quite unguarded. They might be upset and angry and they might say, you know, I think my opponent is cheating. And you don't want everybody to see that. Um, you can also record the video and the chat. You can do that separately. Um, if you haven't got much room on your computer, you just record the chat, it's quite useful. If you need it for future, just in case there are any disputes, who said what, to whom, and when. Um, I've also got a, a WhatsApp group set up because not everybody understands how to use Zoom or is comfortable with using Zoom. And sometimes they're very comfortable using WhatsApp. So I've got a WhatsApp Tornello help desk set up just for my tournaments. And quite often I've noticed what happens is a player will raise an issue on that help desk and before I've had a chance to even notice that there's a message somebody else has stepped in a parent or a more experienced player and they've given the answer to that player's query and sometimes it's a query about something I didn't even know the answer to so I've learned something so think about that your audience they need to have a channel through which to communicate with you ironically players often say um, I'm uncomfortable about being on camera 
um, and that's why I don't play in your tournaments. That's a serious barrier to participation. We have to overcome that. Um, over the board, ironically, those players have no problems. Anyone can walk into an over the board chess tournament. They can look at your game. They can spend hours watching the tournament and no one thinks that's strange. But, but online, people are slightly worried about it. Even though being online, it's a lot more controlled. I mean, you can control who comes into your Zoom chat. You can control how they communicate. Um, but you need to talk to your players about that. So top tip is explain to your players how they can change the background on Zoom. Because a lot of players feed back to me and they say, I, I don't want to be on camera because I'm... I'm, I live in a messy place. I live with other people. I'm embarrassed about how messy it is. You can explain to them how you can change the Zoom background. So it's either neutral or it's, um, it could be a picture of, uh, you know, a, an Ikea showroom, something that's beautiful to look at. And they don't realize that because they haven't used Zoom. Um, okay. Slide number five. This is, this is the secret sauce. Okay. Encourage your players to create their own ideal environment. So I've noticed, I watched the Magnus tour and I watched the players gradually become more accustomed to playing online and improving their environment, you know, changing their backgrounds and changing their chairs. And suddenly several players would acquire the same kind of gaming chair, uh, that kind of thing. And I, and I realized that you, you really need to encourage your players to put some thought into their ideal playing environment, something that, suits them and it struck me that these days all of our players when you consider what they're doing playing chess using zoom playing chess online in front of an audience they're basically streamers so they need to consider the making the best of their physical environment like streamers do having having to spend hours in front of the camera online for their own benefit so i i pinched this um screenshot from uh, a streamer's set up um, and let's have a look at it i mean over the board players cannot control their environment that well if you walk into a chess tournament hall you get an uncomfortable chair and the table's too low and the board is too big and the pieces are too small the pen that they give you it doesn't work and the score sheets have tiny little spaces to write the moves down and so on the room's too hot the room's too cold everybody's squashed into a tiny space that might just be my event. So online, online for the first time, they have the chance to design their perfect environment and they may not even have thought about it. So if you look at the screenshot, this is a streamer set up. You realize um, what, they've, what they've done is they've, they've customized a corner of their room. You may not have a whole room to dedicate to playing chess online, but you know, you can find a corner where you won't be disturbed. Um, encourage them to rehearse using a camera and adjusting the camera angle and not sitting on a sofa playing with a laptop and uh, the camera is basically showing the top of their head, that kind of thing. Um, they, they're usually inflicting upon themselves a suboptimal playing environment when they're playing chess. Um, the other thing about this is that, that the person who has this set up is using a large screen um, rather than two screens. Two screens is, is a luxury, but one large screen is really good because you can put Tornello on one side of the screen and you can put Zoom on the other side of the screen. Um, this person has got their own wireless mouse, which is always nice. Um, they've also got a separate camera. You don't have to have a separate camera but it is um, very useful because then you can reposition the webcam to show maybe um, a physical board, I'll come back to that, or a different viewing angle if the arbiter asks to see the screen, for instance. Um, if you're in time trouble, you don't want to suffer from mouse slip, so that a good mouse is always essential. And of course, they've got a headset. So when I first started organizing events online, the number of people who simply did not have a separate camera or even a simple headset was surprising. And now they all have a separate headset. It's, it's as simple as if you just want to, to 
to mute people and you can't find the mute button you just take the headset off and put it somewhere you can't hear it um, I get asked a lot, how can I improve my game online? You know, I play too fast or I, I lose concentration. These are adults talking. The answer is that you, you need to, like David said, um, use a bit of psychology. You need to trick your brain, your own brain, into taking the game more seriously. And what players have told me is that sometimes they, they use little tricks like this. They use a scorebook to write their game down, even when they're playing online and playing on Tornello, which captures the PGN instantly, and you can download it after you've played your game. Um, players just find that writing the game down in a scorebook slows them down and makes them take it more seriously, like an over-the-board game. Um, some players play with a real wooden set, or at least um, a plastic set, but just a real set, and the camera is directed towards their board while they're playing. So the arbiter can always see the, the set. They can see that the player isn't using the set to analyze the game. Obviously that would be naughty. Um, so when the player makes a move on the board, as soon as they see it on the screen, they make a move on the board, they analyze, they move the piece on the board, then they move the piece on the screen. Okay, it, it helps create a more serious atmosphere for those players. Some people have been brought up in the online environment and they're used to playing in 2D. Um, but a lot of my players are coming to it for the first time and playing in 3D is, is what they're comfortable with. Uh, and, it, and it works. I've noticed that um, some very serious online tournaments have featured the same kind of environment. You know, the Grandmaster will be playing on a table with a real board, but the camera is directed at that board so that you can see everything. Um, I mean, those same players at the beginning of lockdown, those players were playing fast games, blundering. They were very easily distracted by outside events and they weren't really concentrating. And right now I see more players playing longer games, which are really high quality. And because I do some coaching online, I try and encourage my students to play in these tournaments and they're getting a lot more from their games than ever before. Um, so. Those are my ideas. I hope they'll help you improve your events. Basically, encourage, encourage you to talk to your players regularly, provide them with lots of information about the environment that they're about to find themselves in, in Tornello and Zoom. Give them top tips to make their experience better. Um, the night before, email them or, or encourage them to think about their environment before the day of the event. Remember that they're playing in front of an audience and that they can be uncomfortable with that, try and reassure them, and hopefully they'll have an excellent tournament. I've had the experience of several players who said, uh, I will never play chess online um, because they associated it with Blitz, but then they changed their minds because they realized that we're in an environment where over the board chess isn't gonna happen for another six months. So they played in my events and they came to me and they said, this is, this is the best experience I've had online, but it's also, the best experience I've had playing chess in a tournament because of I've been able to create my own environment. I never get this kind of environment in one of your tournaments. So they were really excited to play in the next online tournament because of that, which was really great. Um, so give us lots of feedback, put it in the chat. Uh, feel free to email me um, anytime and I'm, I'll be happy to, to give you some advice. Great, thank you, Adam. That was uh, excellent. Excellent, excellent. And I, I really, um, you know, I really think that we can we can stress the idea of um, here we go. We can stress the idea of a scheduled event uh, and just understand the difference between scheduled events and on-demand chess. So I can see people asking questions about blitz chess and people's 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 only experience of online chess pre you know April 2020 was what was what I call on-demand chess. That is a platform that you can go to 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you can play as much chess as you like very, very easily. Um, but for me, that chess is commodity chess. You know, that is, uh, it's when, when something is cheap and easy or free and in abundance, it is by, by, by definition, a commodity. 
And so a lot of players go, oh, you know, but that's not really what we're in chess for. We don't want to get onto an arena style tournament and play, you know, a hundred games in half an hour. Like that's, that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for what, what you do, Adam, which is an arbiter led scheduled event. You know, it might be classical time controls or it might be rapid time controls, but the, the point is that it is, uh, it's higher value to the players. And so I often draw an analogy with music, like, well, how much would you pay to listen to a song? And the answer is zero because you can go on YouTube and play any song you want, any time of day or night, you know, completely on demand. And yet people still pay 100, 200, $300 for an hour, an hour and a half's concert with a live musician, you know, and sometimes a lot more, they're traveling across the world to go and see their, their, their favorite musician. So why is it that they're exactly the same music? The notes are the same. You can listen to it free on demand anytime you like, you know, and yet you're, you're prepared to pay sometimes thousands of dollars for an experience for an hour or two that you, you can never repeat. It's, it's, it's there for one time and it's gone. And I think we should be thinking about this as chess tournament arbiters as well, about creating these experiences of, of scheduled events. And Adam, you've done a great job of kind of sharing some of the things that can make those events more of a scheduled event that can set the framing for those events so that people do value them more. And you know, when they value them more, they'll pay an entry fee and they'll pay a higher entry fee, which of course is essential for any organization. I know the English Chess Federation in the news is, is struggling with, uh, you know, with renewals. You know, every country you know, and every organization around the world will be um, you know, finding the financial realities difficult at the moment uh, because there's just so much online free commodity chess like why are people paying? And it's our responsibility as organizers and arbiters to, to create those environments that, uh, that make it feel like a really important tournament. Okay. Um, so fantastic, uh, fantastic. I, I just want to share a quick story about um, the very first tournament that we ran online. Okay. So we, uh, we, we thought very naively, it's April, 2020, I'm like, okay, we're gonna run a we're gonna run a kids tournament. There's gonna be no prizes. There's gonna be no official titles. There's gonna be, uh, you know, we're gonna get players to play against people they already know. We're gonna use their real name so that they've got their real reputation up for uh, up at uh, you know uh, at stake. We're gonna have an arbiter present, and we're gonna have the environment, you know, conducive, psychologically conducive to fair play. I'm like, that's it. We're done. Like we've solved cheating. How easy is this? And off we went and ran this tournament. We ended up with 300 players playing. Um, 300, 300 players playing in this tournament. And after three rounds, I started getting like a flood of, you know, kind of suspicion, inquiries, complaints, whatever you want to call it. And, and the, 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 the issue was, okay, people are, people are, you know, people are getting assistance. You know, this was an unfair game. And, and it really opened my eyes to the fact that just having a good environment uh, is, is not enough. All right. I don't think it's possible to solve this problem without the environment. But if you just rely on the environment, you say, look, everybody's using their real name. Everybody's, you know, able to see each other on Zoom if they want to. You know, you know we've, we've set this up as an entry fee tournament. Like there's no prize money. Like you can do all of these things to, to make it, but that's not enough, right? So we, we, we learned from that. We had to end, we ended up disqualifying uh, nine or uh, 10 players from that. One of them mistakenly so, and I'll, I might talk about that later on. Um, but you know, nine, nine players were, were getting assistance out of the 300 and we, we got rid of them. Um, and that was a, a really tough challenge for us to go, well, you know, we had to learn the hard way. So the second, the second thing that we, that we, that we did, and, and this is what we see in best practice in tournaments around the world, is not just having the environment right, but also doing some supervision. And to talk about supervision, I'm going to introduce you now to uh, international arbiter, uh, Yezhina Prokopova. She is the first female FIDE arbiter in the Czech Republic. She's the youngest category A arbiter in, in the world. She's on a bunch of commissions and councils, including the FIDE Arbiters Commission and the ECU Arbiters Council and chairman of the Czech Arbiters Commission. Uh, and she's been uh, the arbiter at the last two Olympiads and also the online Olympiad and the online uh, European Youth Championship. So it's got a lot of experience to share with us in terms of uh, running online events. Uh, Irina, welcome. Thank you, David, for the introduction. 
So, uh, as you heard, my topic is uh, supervision, which is uh, step two of ensuring fair play during online chess events in theory. And uh, what exactly is supervision is basically the role of the arbiter. And uh, the arbiter may have different roles. Maybe you are more familiar with being something like an organizer uh, or uh, some kind of judge, or uh, sometimes you are maybe a little bit of a butler, whatever the players need, need right? Uh, but uh, you are always supervising something. And in this analogy, you are something like a policeman and you are trying to uh, be there present as uh, well as uh, the policemen are and, and they, when they are trying to eliminate speeding. And uh, surely they also don't think that they will elim eliminate it all. So this is uh, very similar. We don't think that uh, we will be able to uh, eliminate all the cheating and there will be nobody uh, left in the world, but we just want to uh, do something uh, because it is important not to overlook this issue and uh, to take some action uh, so we can uh, create an atmosphere where people trust each other and they don't have to waste energy on thinking well my opponent uh, is slower rated and this is doing very good moves he's probably cheating we don't want this over the board and we don't want this online so what, what are what are the things uh, that uh, can be done? You already know it. Uh, I, I will just remind you. Uh, at the uh, at the very least, you should always be doing something because, uh, as David said, the, there are uh, two types of cheating, and there is this malicious cheating, which is. I think more present over the board because you already don't have anonymity there and uh, you have you see the um, your opponent and, and so on so it's a little bit different but uh, my worry is that maybe uh, if you uh, playing online you check uh, your move once because once maybe it's not that bad then you do it second time then you uh, then you are uh, getting the assistance for the whole game and my worry is maybe this uh, kind of uh, uh, situations will lead uh, to people taking this over the board and that we will have increase of uh, cheating uh, after we uh, get back over, over the board. So uh, it is uh, something we should uh, be focused on. And uh, even if you have amateur tournament, it is good to, uh, to have some kind of verification, which is a topic David will talk about later. And uh, it is based on some statistical analysis and screening of uh, uh, the games. And uh, it is uh, uh, the real thing. It is uh, based on uh, some scientific uh, approach. And uh, it is not just, uh, well, I think he's cheating. This is my, my opinion is that uh, this game looks looks a bit dodgy. So maybe, or he's uh, he's uh, getting a lot of points for his rating. That's uh, a little suspicious. No, this is this is like real data that uh, uh, that have a real value. And uh, at uh, some local events or some kids events, your uh, uh, everyday tournaments, you should at least use this and uh, use it as a decision making tool. But if you have some uh, uh, some event with uh, higher rated players, maybe you can uh, do some more. Maybe you can use either camera or maybe you can gather uh, your players in, <clears throat> in some room and uh, have arbiter present there, uh, which is uh, something we call uh, hybrid events. Uh, if you have an uh, even higher rated tournament, maybe on a national level, you have some titled players there and so on, maybe you want to do more. Yeah, maybe uh, use camera and uh, at the same time uh, have all the players at your uh, Zoom call when they are, have to be present, uh, share their screen. So uh, you have some way of checking what they are doing on their computers and uh, you can uh, always uh, check it if you if you need to if you feel that uh, something is going on there and uh, you can check it randomly and uh, any any time you want or you can again uh, have this kind of hybrid event and maybe 
uh, have one arbiter present in the room and second online arbiter who would be checking the screen share because the arbiter present uh, also can, can't be everywhere. But uh, it is uh, a very uh, good and interesting option, I think. And uh, if you go even higher, then uh, the stakes are higher and uh, prices and everything, uh, you want to be maybe even more thorough. Uh, you want to have uh, your camera, which is uh, showing your face while you are playing, but maybe you want to have another camera from the other side, so uh, it shows your screen and uh, the uh, space around your computer. Uh, as I heard about uh, tournaments like uh, Magnus Tour and so on, maybe they have up to five cameras in their room. They are not uh, broadcasting for, from every, uh, every of them, but uh, the arbiters have access to them. So they know exactly what is going on in the room. Uh, or you could again uh, exchange these uh, sets of cameras for arbiter who is there with them in the room. But in any case, you would like to use a share screen. Uh, so you have some control over this and maybe uh, you would also like to hear what is going on in the room. Uh, so uh, no matter what level of tournament you have, you should always do something. And uh, I think in every, any kind of cheating, uh, is it over the board or online, it is always important to uh, consider the level of the tournament and uh, to have uh, measures which are appropriate for the level of the event. For example, if you are uh, playing over the board, some lower league, you can't have uh, realistic expectations that players who are playing there uh, spend thousands of dollars for some fancy equipment and that you need some uh, special detector to uh, find that out. You just tell them don't use your phones and you uh, somehow check that they are not doing that. So in the same way, uh, use this analogy and apply it to the online world and just have reasonable demands uh, for, the, for the players. Because uh, in the same time, uh, we know that uh, majority is not cheating and uh, over the board and online, we don't want to spoil the game for everybody. We want to be reasonable and have reasonable uh, measures which uh, will not make it difficult to play the game and to enjoy the game. Uh, so it is not necessary to have overly strict rules for the lower competitions, but it is very good to have some of them. So if, you, if we look at them uh, uh, more closely, uh, uh, here we have a picture from, from European uh, Youth Championship, which was played online as one of the biggest hybrid events we had recently. Uh, players from every federation were gathered uh, together and uh, some local arbiters was there present with them. Uh, that is, uh, I think, very good option for this. And it is certainly not a new thing. Uh, these kind of matches and school events and other tournaments were played before also, because it is a way uh, how to play somebody on the other side of the world, of course. And if the, with the arbiter present, you can be fairly certain that uh, nothing bad is going on there. There are some people who, who are concerned that local arbiters from the same country are biased. I would like to think that arbiters are never biased and it doesn't matter if uh, you, are, uh, you are there with the match of your team. You, you have no team, you are, you are the arbiter, so you don't belong to any federation. But uh, it is maybe better to prevent uh, these kind of uh, ways of thinking and if you if it is possible to have a different arbiter because you don't want to uh, get yourself trapped in this uh, in this kind of uh, uh, danger so then uh, if you don't have this option uh, you don't have the room you you don't want to make a hybrid events you just want uh, the, the players to play from home and uh, then you should uh, always have some uh, clear rules what is supposed to be done. So, of course, the camera on is a very good thing to do. You, you see what is going on, you see if somebody is talking to the player. Uh, of course, uh, you can't see everywhere with one camera, but you can see something. And uh, that already means that uh, you have more options than you had before. And uh, 
Some platforms prefer, for example, to ask players before the game just to lift the laptop and show the playing area because uh, usually they are forbidden to have any kind of electronic devices uh, in the room at all and there should no, be no people and so on. So if you have time, you can do this kind of checking before the game. Um, then there is the screen share, which is, which is very useful thing. Uh, obviously, uh, there are also limitations, like somebody can be sitting uh, out of the angle of the camera. Uh, with this, it's the same thing. Uh, you can have two screens and sharing only one. Uh, of course, uh, we all know this, but again, you are doing something and, and uh, you can already uh, make a use of it. And uh, you should uh, encourage players to use the option to sh share the whole screen, not just uh, some random window, because then you can see the taskbar and you can see whether there are other apps uh, turned on on the computer. Uh, if you have time, what we, for, for example, did at the Olympiad, we were asking players at first randomly and then uh, in uh, later stages, uh, everybody to turn on the task manager where you can see all the programs which are running. And uh, since then they, are, uh, they have to keep sharing the screen. So you saw there is nothing else running and uh, there was no option to turn anything on because they were already under supervision. <coughs> uh, sound is uh, a little bit tricky because uh, it may be uh, distracting for the players because in the early tournaments uh, we used to uh, just turn on the microphone when we, when we had some suspicion that something is going on in the background. We just turned it on, listen, listened and uh, uh, made, made some call. But uh, then the Zoom evolved and we have no uh, new privacy settings. So it is not uh, possible anymore to do this. They have to agree to turn on the sound. So again, what we did at the Olympiad uh, was that all players had to turn on uh, their microphones at the beginning and then uh, they were allowed to play. So uh, they could have uh, just turned on the, off the speakers if that was uh, disturbing them, but some of them wanted to hear uh, the sound of the platform. So uh, there were some complaints and let's say it's just a, a kind of a, a advanced option to, to ask them to have their sound on. But if you are not doing that, then I see no point in uh, not allowing them to have their headphones or uh, something like that because you are not hearing what is going on in the room anyway. So it doesn't matter if it's out loud or in the, in the headphones. Uh, so uh, these are the basic things that you, you can use and just uh, choose some of them and uh, make a use of them at, uh, at the event and uh, it, will, it will help. Uh, of course, you are not uh, able to watch all the players all the time. Uh, usually what you have, you have maybe 50 players uh, for, in your Zoom call and uh, you uh, can't watch 50 cameras and 50 uh, screen shared at the same time. You are doing random checks as in over the board chess. Uh, if uh, we are checking some players randomly after the round, uh, we ask them to show their pockets and so on. That's uh, the same principle. You are doing it randomly. So it can happen to anyone at any time, uh, but you don't have the manpower to check everything. And that's okay because it's enough. Uh, we have uh, plenty of differences with uh, over the board uh, chess and online chess. I already mentioned some of them, but uh, what I wanted to say was uh, that uh, often we hear about uh, limitations of online chess and that uh, it is not the same. You don't have uh, the same experience and uh, some people like that online chess are, is different and online chess is not anything new. It, it's here for, for many, many years now, but uh, now it uh, has more attention. So we are trying to uh, change it a little bit as somebody likes that, that we are trying to make it uh, similar to the over the board experience and some would like to stay uh, where they were before. Uh, so you just, you just need to pick the platform that suits your needs and that's uh, working well for you. And uh, 
with the with the uh, over the watches uh, you have uh, you have some things you are used to doing like uh, preparing the playing hall and uh, setting the clocks communicating with the players in a certain way and in online chess uh, you have you have different options your playing hall is basically your platform the one that you choose and uh, there are different options and you have to be aware that uh, maybe if you choose some it will uh, it will mean that there will be some changes in the laws of chess because uh, there are some uh, Autom automatization processes like uh, declaring a draw uh, after threefold repetition automatically, so players don't have to uh, don't have to claim it, or you don't, or uh, it uh, the game ends uh, in the dead position, uh, which would uh, not be the case in uh, over the board chess, and uh, so the uh, choice of the platform is a big deal, and it. Uh, and you, you should consider what you want for your for your event and be aware of uh, what uh, uh, what is it that you are working with and get familiar with it because as i said it's, it is some kind of playing hole for you and and uh, it is important uh, to know what you are doing because you are there to guide the players you are there to help them as in uh, normal tournaments, you are the link between the organizers and the players, and you are supposed to protect them and help them. In the online event, it's the same thing. Uh, you are the link between the organizers and the platforms and the players. And uh, if you are not there to help them, uh, who else is there? So uh, that le leads me to uh, saying that you need uh, clear instructions for the players, and uh, you need to have uh, to be able to do that, you have to have clear rules to begin with. If you want them uh, to be able to share their screens and if you want them to have their camera, you have to uh, tell them in advance. And if uh, that's the case, you need to teach them. Because uh, assuming they will know what to do is uh, just naive and you can't, you can't do that. If you want them to do something, you have to teach them and you have to provide uh, provide them with, uh, with opportunity to uh, be prepared for it. So you can email them as, as Adam said, or uh, you, can, you can prepare some video how to, how to do it or uh, some uh, document, or you can have the practice matches, which is a great thing to do. We had them at uh, European events and we had them at uh, Olympiad. And in both cases, we also that is very useful. And it is not just useful for the players, it is uh, useful for you too. Because you also never done this exactly before. So it helps to, uh, to try it out and uh, uh, be there together with them. And uh, then it uh, will make your life easy later. And in general, it is important to uh, educate uh, in advance, uh, to educate coaches that this is important and uh, also uh, the parents and organizers, officials, everyone involved should be aware of this because if we think that this is a problem of arbiters and nobody else cares, then it, uh, we, we will not be able to do anything with it. Uh, so uh, just keep that in mind, do yourself a favor, set a appeals committee so in case of trouble, trouble you have a way of doing, uh, dealing with that and uh, these are just, uh, just uh, the common practical, practical guidelines. Uh, uh, you, you need to have uh, some uh, set of uh, penalties in place. Uh, if you have, if you tell them you have to share your screen all the time, you have to be able to say if you don't, this will happen, or uh, uh, you are not, you you will not be able to play, or you will get a warning, or anything. You can you can set whatever you want, but you have to be aware that uh, uh, you need to <laughs> uh, deliver on that. If you say I will do this, you should do that. It's important to be consistent and to make no exceptions for anybody. Uh, treat ev everybody uh, in the same way and uh, don't think, well, this person would never cheat, so uh, 
they are playing badly anyway, they don't need to share the screen. No, we have these rules and everybody needs to follow uh, those rules. So uh, just uh, uh, try to uh, measure every, uh, everyone in the same way as you would in the, over the board. And uh, then uh, everybody else will see it. The other players see it. They see that uh, whether their, their teammates and opponents are sharing their screens or not. So don't think they don't. Uh, and uh, what to do if, if you find something out? What, what happens to us, for example, at the uh, European Championship? Some, some of my colleagues found some players who had uh, chess base running uh, in, the, in the background. So, there were some consequences. Or uh, we got uh, information, you should follow uh, on this player because he's scoring very high. And uh, maybe something mm, dodgy is going there, uh, going on there. And uh, so I went to see this player. I was uh, looking at him on camera and I was looking at his uh, screen share. And I saw all the emotions that were going on there. He was like touching his head when something went wrong and he was smiling when it went well. And he was uh, going like crazy with his uh, mouse over the board, touching uh, th this, uh, this piece for a while and then the other. And uh, well, I said, if this guy is cheating, then he's an excellent actor and he should just uh, do that instead of chess. And uh, I think that is very strong evidence. And uh, Oh, you, you, don't have to, you don't have to believe that, but uh, I think it shows a lot. And in any case, if you have the screen shared, you are not just looking if there are other uh, apps running. If you, if you get uh, information from your, uh, from your uh, fair play report, uh, you see this player has uh, high, high numbers. So I will uh, look at him closely. And uh, you can see what happened to us, for example, at the Olympiad. We had such case and we saw that the player uh, was moving his cursor out of the uh, shared screen. It was disappearing during the game. So we asked what is going on and uh, well, he said uh, it was a rapid game. Uh, I was bored, I was checking up on, on the news and uh, that's, that's the reason. Well, what a coincidence that you are reading the news on the day that you are playing like Magnus Carlsen. Uh, we are not sure that we are completely uh, we completely believe this. So there, uh, the, the, these cases uh, are exactly why we have those rules and uh, why it is uh, very good to, to follow on that. Uh, so in any case, uh, keep in mind that there are uh, lots of advantages in online chess. Uh, you don't have to be bothered with touch move. Uh, touch move is something that we uh, talk on every every arbiter seminar there is. Uh, yes, he touched it, touched it. No, he didn't, and so on. And you don't have to deal with this because uh, they can click wherever they want, and after they make the move, then it's uh, finally part of the game. They can't do any any illegal moves. There is no playing with both hands. No. Uh, uh, pushing the clock without making any move and so on. So uh, focus on the positives and uh, know that uh, uh, as an arbiter, your life is not harder. It is just different. You need a different skill set and uh, uh, it is uh, something that uh, you can learn if you don't know it already. And uh, just uh, try uh, to convince everybody that this is not something we, can, uh, we can't overlook and we have to uh, keep our attention to this. At the end, I just want to say that uh, uh, myself, I am uh, more, I, I was more interested in over the board cheating, especially before. And uh, I was attending a program organized by Czech Olympic Committee where uh, I was supposed to write some paper from the world of chess and uh, my board asked me if I could uh, solve cheating for, for them because we, they, we had so many cases and well, you should, you should come up with some rules. I'm like, okay, I will do that, no problem. So uh, I, wrote a, I wrote a paper uh, which uh, was supposed to uh, 
introduce arbiters into this and uh, make them aware of, of these things and give them some guidance what to do because you don't deal with it on a daily basis but once or twice in your life so you deserve some guidance and well our board uh, thought that it might be interesting for other people too so they translated it to English and I showed it to David and he said well we have uh, people at anti-cheating seminar or fair play seminar and maybe they would like to read that too so he will send it to you and if you are in a lockdown or something like that maybe you will have time to read it so thank you for your attention and uh, good luck with your tournaments uh, thank you very much. Excellent, excellent uh, to hear all of all of the experiences that you've had uh, in some of those other online tournaments. And uh, if if any if anybody if any of the organisers out there have some more specific questions about you know what sort of rules they should be applying like in a in a disconnection situation or uh, you know any of the any of the things that uh, Eugenia has talked about. Um, please, you know, we'll have some question time at the end or feel free to email through some questions. And we'll get those questions through to her as well so that you can uh, kind of dig in a bit deeper about the different types of supervision and the different types of rules that apply. Um, um, and, you know, maybe we can even get you some samples of, of some of these, some of these sorts of rules. So, um, uh, yeah, that's uh, the, the, next, the next phase of, uh, of any fair play process during a tournament. Uh, is is what we call verification process, and I just want to stress, uh, you know, as much as we can that um, before a verification process, there has to be some other things going on. You know, we've talked about the environment, we've talked about supervision, and the idea is that those processes that you have will make sure that the verification is just always a, a, a you know a tick of approval. It's just something which reassures you that all of the work that you've done. Uh, it has been enough. Um, it should not be that the verification is your tool to try and stop cheating because the verification comes after the event is finished, right? And so after the event is finished or after the round is finished, after the game is finished, it's too late to do anything, uh, to do anything about it, right? The goal has to be to prevent crime, not just to not just to deal with it once it happens. So um, there are some tools that, that we have available to us today, which is great, which will give us a statistical analysis of the game of chess that was played and correlate that and say, is that game look like it was played by somebody of that rating? All right, so it relies on a few things. It relies on knowing something about the player beforehand. It relies on you know the player playing at their own you know rating level, okay. So um, it's really important, I think, for me that these decisions about fair play and about consequences for players, if there have to be any, these decisions are made by a, a human being, made by an arbiter, and allowing a platform to you know automatically disconnect and disqualify people. Um, when you give away that responsibility to make decisions, you also give away your power uh, and, and the perception that you're actually in control of the event. So, um, you know, there are, there is, there is, there's going to be always lots of situations where there's possibly a false positive or a false negative. That is, you, you, tr you, you penalize somebody for getting assistance when they didn't really get assistance or where you miss somebody and you let them get away with it when when they when they did get some assistance, right? And um, I think it's really I think it's it's really much better when those decisions rest on your shoulders as the arbiter of the tournament. Um, you have to make those decisions and and deferring those decisions to you know a third party automated AI. I've seen lots of tournaments where they're played on a on a platform. And the, the platform is in charge of the decision making process. And so then the arbiters don't have any control and they might see some stuff, which is just like, they know the player, they know this player is, you know, 1200 rating. Like, why is it that they're playing at, at 2000 rating? But the, the threshold for the way that they're playing just isn't quite enough for the automatic triggering of the, uh, of, of, of the, of the system. And then 
the arbiter has no control anymore. They have no power to do anything about it because you can't make an exception for one person and say, well, actually, I know you. I'm going to, I'm going to, do, I'm going to do some, apply some different rules for you. Um, you know, we've seen, we've seen people who are getting assistance only against their friend. Like they're just trolling their friend, right? So how can you ever expect a platform to pick up that, you know, every time I play against Adam, I beat him, right? Because I'm getting assistance just when I'm playing against Adam, right? So, you know, a human being can, can, can take into consideration these sorts of things, um, you know, and I think it's just natural justice no, no justice system in the world has got a completely automated process. You can have a speed camera that will take a photo of a car, but then there is still a human being that will uh, get involved and make some decisions about the evidence. So what we want to try and do is present the evidence to the arbiters. And, and when you present the evidence to the arbiters, the arbiters have got all the information available. Now, okay, the arbiters need to, to start uh, you know, educating themselves in in this type of in this type of uh, world, um, but once you've got the information, then you can you can make some decisions. And the decisions can be something that is human made. They can be discussed. There can be logic. There can be uh, you know there can be the the feeling of due process. So I'm going to go through two things now uh, over the next uh, twenty minutes or so. Um, one of them is uh, one of them is the report that. Tornello will provide as a fair play report. And then I'll show you the, the, the gold standard, which is Kenneth Reagan's uh, screening report. And then we can also talk about some of the deeper analysis that can be done if need be. Um, so um, I, will just warn, uh, I will just warn arbiters against the idea of doing things on a kind of an ad hoc basis. It's, it's surprising at how different the results can be from different engines. So you, there are there are kind of three tools that we used before we had uh, you know the the Tornello reports, the Tornello Fair Play report, or the Ken Reagan Fair Play re reports available to us. We would use Lee Chess, which will give you a, a, an analysis of the game, or Chess.com will give you an analysis of the game. Or um, Adam's just put this in the chat. There is a there is a program that you can download onto your computer that runs on your desktop, which is called PGN Spy. It inserts, um, and it was it was uh, created with, by some guys in the University of Cork in the UK, um, who were doing some uh, some you know a, a, uh, some of this research at university, and it inserts um, Stockfish 11, and all of the games run through Stockfish 11, and you get some some reports. So um, I would just say you know when you put it through those three different systems, you will get three very very different results at each time. So just be careful if you're only using one or a lot of times players will do that. They're like, I put the game through chess.com or I put the game on Lee Chess. It's, it's like crazy high scores, you know, but they don't have the experience in actually interpreting those scores. And they're only looking at a very single isolation, an isolated case. All right, so the, the, the stuff that's being done by platforms and by, by Ken Reagan is a bit more sophisticated. So, um, you know, just kind of, Try and bear that in mind when you're doing your own uh, when your own own desktop research as well. Um, so, firstly, this is the Tornello Fair Play Screening Report. This report is generated um, uh, all the time. Okay, and I'm going to talk through what the columns are and how they how they work and what it means. Okay, so um, this this report is kind of uh, being generated live. It's really only able to be looked at at the end of each round. Because um, you know there is there is no there is no assessment on a game in progress, um, and I think it's also you know just the, the the variability that's possible in a single game means that you you're going to be very hard pressed to kind of uh, you know ever make a decision about something based on a single game. Uh, I will frame this report as well by saying that this is a fair play report. This is not a how do you catch cheaters report. So the purpose of this report is who should you ignore. Right. The purpose of the report is to is to eliminate people from from suspicion and just to give you one or two or three people or a small number of people that you should be focusing on a little bit more in your supervision aspect. Right. Because you want to you want to try and prevent cheating. You don't want to try and catch it. 
So what you want to try and do is maybe after round two or round three, you can see some people who've got some uh, high scores, as we'll call them. And then you can talk to those people and say, look, I notice you're playing really, really well at the moment, well above your rating. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to see, you know, I'd love to watch your games and see how you're doing it and, and put that up on the screen. And we want to try and protect this result that you're having in this tournament from any accusations down the track that you might have had assistance. And so we're going to, we're going to, we're going to put you on camera. We're going to, and, and then they know that you're observing them more closely, but you've done it in a really positive way. Instead of saying, Hey, you know, we think you're a bit suspicious. You're, you know, you, you're probably getting some, I'm going to watch you. And now they've got all this negative emotion. And of course they're going to be going, well, you know, screw you. I'm going to find a way that I can do it. You know, so like, let's not get into those battles. Let's be on the same side as the player so that we're all working in the same direction. Players, arbiters, organizers, we're all working in the same direction, which is to build a community of people who are, you know, enjoying the experience. And that is, you know, part of that is about, about fair play. So, okay, with, with that in mind, this is a report to eliminate people. It's, it's for, you know, who do you not look at? Um, we, go through a, we go through a staged process because you can actually tell at a very, very quick analysis, uh, you can actually tell some people who are definitely not getting assistance, right? They're just playing so badly that if they are using a computer, like, good luck to them. You know, you're, you're playing so badly, just let, you, let them keep using the computer because you're doing it a really bad way. So there's a bunch of people that we can kind of, um, discriminate and just go, look, we don't even need to look at you. You're just too hopeless. All right. Um, and then there are people that you want to look at a little bit more deeply. And so what you'll see on the screen in Tornello is you'll see the report, but then it will also tell you we've flagged, you know, three players or four players or 10 players, whatever it is, um, for deeper analysis. Right. And, you know, to start off with, that'll be a lot. We've got a, a much, you know, it's, it's only been a very light analysis that we've done. So in the interest of kind of, uh, you know, speed and efficiency. And so we'll say, okay, here's a bunch of people that you should look deeper at. And then there's a button that you click and you click the button, you say, analyze deeper. And then it produces a, a you know, a, a more detailed report and it might still pick two or three or four people. And so you can go through that process two or three times um, to really dig into the people who, who, who you think need it. And you can see here in this column at the side here, this is the trigger deeper analysis. You know, this is the ones who it's saying, you know, have reached some thresholds that, you, that we think you should go a bit, a bit further. All right, so let's go left to right, explain all the columns, how they work and what, what they are. So the first one is the player name column. I've obviously anonymized this for uh, the purposes of, 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 the, of this public display. And I've, I've anonymized the, the ratings as well. So you can't pick who these who these players are. I think it's really important. You know, we talked before about the about the the consequence of 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 the uh, you know the people who make bad decisions. You know, if somebody does make a bad decision, if they do get some assistance during a game, what should those consequences be? And you know, we want the consequences to be educational in nature, not punitive. So we don't want you know, somebody made a bad decision, they got some assistance during a game in a tournament, we don't want their permanent lifelong reputation in chess to be ruined. And I know there are some people who are out there saying name and shame, lifetime bans, this is not what we want to do. I, we want to keep this report, uh, and this report is, is private to the arbiters, so we don't share this publicly with all the players, because also then they're going to start making some, uh, you know, backyard decisions about, about uh, you know, who's, who's getting assistance and who's not, and making some complaints that you don't need. Um, but also to protect the interests of the players. And I think Eugenio said that really nicely. As arbiters, we are, you know, our job is to protect the players. Our job is to give the players a good experience. So, um, yeah, just, uh, yeah, keep, keep this anonymous. Talk to people when you need to. All right, this first column here is the game moves. How many moves were played in this tournament? So you can see this player's played seven games. And in those seven games, they've played 317 moves. Okay, so the next column here that we'll look at is the moves analysed. We've only analysed 221 out of 317 moves. So the question is, why do we not analyse all the moves for fair play assessment? Well, firstly, if you play E4, did you use a computer or not? Okay, so opening theory is, is opening theory. You know, is it cheating to have read an openings book? Maybe yes, but probably no, all right? Because you're then playing the game independently. So um, the first few moves of a game are ignored um, for, for the purposes of, 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 of analysis, right? We're not going to look at the first between five and eight moves, depending on the type of report that you're running. Okay. So, um, that's, uh, that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is once you're a queen up, like if you're like 
nine points ahead on your on your computer's assessment, then it's just really easy to pick the best move because pretty much any move you're nine you're still nine points ahead. So once you're that far ahead, um, you know. Also, people will often switch off an engine at that point. You know, you're winning. Okay, so we don't need. We, you know, we're, we're far enough ahead that we don't need to get any more assistance. So once you're past a certain threshold, and again, you can have different thresholds. The typical points are five and nine points. Um, uh, you will switch off the the analysis and not consider those moves anymore. So this tells you that 221 out of his 317 moves were considered, and then we get onto the interesting stuff. And there's these two columns here. Uh, an average move match and an average CPL, centipawn loss. So let's talk through those two things and kind of unpack them a bit. So the first one is a move match, okay? Move match as a percentage. So move match is just exactly what it sounds like. We've analyzed 221 moves. How many of those moves matched precisely the move that Stockfish would have chosen? All right, so if you pick 100% of the moves that Stockfish played, then of course you are... Um, you know, you are, you know, probably using the computer. So as a benchmark, if you take Stockfish and you play a game of chess and then you take Stockfish and you analyze the game and say, what would you have played in these situations? Stockfish will only match itself about 75% of the time. Okay, so there's a bit of a perspective for you. If you see somebody who's got a 75% match, you're going, well, that's pretty high. Now, okay, in a single game, it's different, but the more moves you analyze, the more of the more games you get under your belt, the the you know the more kind of normal the distribution curve becomes. All right, and think about it like rolling a dice. If you roll a dice five times, you could very easily expect to get five sixes in a row. It's not beyond the realms of possibility. But if you roll that dice a hundred thousand times, you're going to get now a normal distribution curve of one through sixes, assuming that the dice is not loaded. Right, so this is the sort of this is this is what statistical analysis and correlation analysis requires. It requires a large sample size to, to give you confidence in in the in the in the numbers. All right, so um, the first one to look at this move match. It's just simply the number of moves that matched the computer's analysis. So here, if there was 221 moves played, he's matched uh, two thirds of them. So I can I can do the maths. 66% of 221 is 145, 146 moves. So 146 out of 221 have matched exactly. To give you some benchmarks, just to put in your in in your head, just some ideas in terms of uh, you know of of what what uh, you know what I think about. Anything above 60%, anything above 60% is um, something that is uh, suspicious. So. If we look at um, world champions and look at, you know, how do they play and what sort of move match percentages are they going to be scoring? Um, world champions are going to be, be scoring in, a, in, cent, in move match. Um, so like Magnus Carlsen, we analysed, uh, you know, a bunch of his games, wins and losses. So it's probably a bit subpar for Carlsen uh, because there was an equal number of wins and losses and he was scoring 58% move match. Kasparov was at 50%. Capablanca was at 57%. So... Um, typically, you know, um, you know, high rated players are going to be scoring in the, you know, mid to high, mid to high 50s. Um, if we take uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of, of games of players rated above 2,700 through the years 2006 to 2009, the average move match across all of those moves of all of those games was 56%. Okay, and that's 2,700 rated players and above. Of course, in an individual event and individual players, you could do differently. So Anton Smirnoff is one of our best uh, best chess players in Australia, and he was an absolutely stunning junior. In 2012, he played in the Australian Junior Championships. I don't know, he was about you know four years old or something, already 2200, um, and and skyrocketing skyrocketing towards uh, towards GM level, and he scored 59% move match in that tournament, and that was an over the board tournament. So of course, there is no uh, you know, no no um, consideration, no suspecting, uh, suspected that he's had any assistance in those games. He was just a superstar player. So just be, be aware, um, as a rule of thumb, anything above 60% move match for me is like, mm, that's, that's really, really hard to achieve across the whole tournament, really difficult. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, you are, uh, you are, you are probably a, uh, you know, either a, a super strong player 
or you're getting some assistance uh, at that point. Um, but of course, bear in mind, it does depend on the number of moves you've analyzed. So if you've only got 40 moves analyzed and you've got a 65%, okay, this is, this is you know, you can't really, you can't really, um, you can't really be as concerned about that. But if you've got 260 moves analyzed and 60, 60% move, 60 move match, all right, this is something to, um, to, be, to be aware of. Remember, this is also a raw score. So this just tells you what the move match is. It doesn't tell you what that player should be expected to score. You know, if you're a grandmaster scoring 66%, you're going to be a lot less concerned than if you're somebody who's rated 900, who's scored 60%. In fact, if you're someone who's rated 900 and you're scoring more than 60%, like there's no questions. Okay, that's fine. I can just eliminate that, that person. Um, but do be very careful when you're looking at just a single game. All right, so if you're looking at a single game and these three columns on the right-hand side show you a single game. This is the best game that the person's played in the tournament. This shows you the number of moves in that best game. Their best centi pawn loss, their best move match. Okay, these three columns here. So this will tell you, in the, this person's best game, they played 23 moves and 100% of those moves were perfect, right? It's a centipawn loss of zero. Well, 91% of the moves, that must mean that there was, you know, one or two moves which were, you know, pr pretty, pretty bloody close that it rounds to zero, right, in terms of centipawn loss. Um, so, uh, you know, 91% on a single game, yeah, okay, that's possible, but over 23 moves, that's, that's pretty difficult. If it's over six moves, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a bit bit more believable. So, you know, just be very careful when it's a single game. So these, these statistics do rely on, uh, on, on, on longer, longer term, uh, longer, longer statistics. So um, that's, our, that's our move match. The second number that we, that we want to consider is this uh, average CPL. So CPL stands for centi pawn loss. A centi pawn is one one hundredth of a pawn. So computers evaluate positions and they convert the evaluation of the position into a number that tells you how many pawns ahead you are. So if you're exactly one pawn ahead, you know, material position, everything taken into consideration, you are 100 centi pawns ahead of, of, of your opponent, okay? One pawn ahead. So what we can do is we can try to work out how close to the best move is the player playing, right? Because just telling us that they played the best move or didn't play the best move is one thing, that's like a perfect move match, but it's actually really inf in useful information to know how close to that move, to that best move, did they play? So a centi pawn uh, loss tells you, okay, if your position, on a, if the computer evaluated, evaluated your position as a one pawn loss, you're one pawn behind, and then you make a move and your evaluation drops from minus one pawn to minus two pawns, you've just lost 100 centi pawns. You've lost one pawn, with that move. If you'd played the best move, you would have stayed at minus one, but you've dropped to minus two. So we collect those centi pawn losses over each move that we're analyzing and we average it. So what is the average centi pawn loss across all your moves and all your games? You know, and um, you know, when, when, I, when I play a game of chess, uh, you know, I'm gonna be somewhere between you know, 0.4 uh, up to uh, you know, 0.9, kind of, that would be my normal range. You know, so I'm, I'm going to be losing half a pawn or more on every single move. Like I'm not a very strong player, you know, 2000 type rating. Uh, you know, you're going to be losing a significant amount of material every single move by comparison to what the, the world, the, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the god of chess stockfish will be, will be playing. So we can compare how much you're going to be losing. All right. Now, of course, in any one game, I have had my, uh, you know, I've analyzed a bunch of games and I think Adam, it was, I analyzed the games in that tournament that I came to when I was in London. I played in a Golders Green tournament. I had some good games. And one of those games, I had a, a 14 centi pawn loss. So it's absolutely possible to have a very low centi pawn loss in a single game. Again, to give you some benchmarks of centi pawn losses and what those numbers could look like if you're a world champion, um, Carlson Kasparov, Capablanca are all scoring in the low 20s uh, in, on, on, on longer term averages. So, you know, um, 22, 23, 24 is kind of uh, a centi pawn loss for a, a world champion, uh, you know, at a, at a, at a long-term average, you know, and, and not necessarily when they're playing their best. You know, if they're playing their best, they can get much, much lower. Um, Stockfish itself, so you play the computer and you just go like Stockfish, play a game, what's your centi pawn loss? Stockfish will get a, a centi pawn loss of around four or five, okay? 
So four or five centi point, like stockfish is not going to match perfectly, but it's going to be pretty bloody close. Okay. So four one hundredths of a pawn to five one hundredths of a pawn difference on average for every single move. Right. You can never get a positive score in that. It's always a centi pawn loss. Okay. So that's what the centi pawn loss is, is scoring. And so again, if you just want some kind of, uh, you know, benchmark, like 20 is, is, is a really good score. Okay. So we take these two numbers and we add them together and we make this sort score. Okay. And a sort score will kind of tell you a bit about both of these numbers combined together. All right. And then, um, you know, arbiters, I know, you know, you don't want to understand the whole analysis. You want to make your own, you know, just kind of like focus on one thing. You're under time pressure. You know, it's a tournament, you, you know, in between round three and round four, like you've got to decide who to look at. This, this tournament will, this report will sort according to this score. That's why we call it a sort score. And the idea is it puts the person who is most like a computer at the top and the person who's least like a computer at the bottom. So it's just a nice at a glance view. Like, let's just look at the people who are at the top of the page. And if we can eliminate one or two of those people uh, or, you know, prevent them from cheating or get some early intervention, then we're going to be, we're going to be, you know, having some success. Okay, so again, sort scores, what sort of scores should you be looking for? So a score of above 40, 40 or above, is a grandmaster on a good day, all right? So a grandmaster on a good day is a sort score of 40. Let me tell you, this report for anybody under 2000 is pretty good. Uh, the lower rated you are, the easier it is to just kind of know, you know, with, without any sort of, you know, without any shadow of a doubt, or you know, there's always shadow of a doubt, but with, with kind of, you know, higher degree of certainty. Uh, as you get, past 2000 and towards 2400, it, um, it becomes like reasonable, um, and, but gets harder and harder as you get closer and closer to, to, to master level. Above 2400, um, I, I, I think that this will, you know, it'll tell you who to keep an eye on, but it's not gonna tell you any answers. You need to then defer to the gold standard, Kenneth Reagan's reports, and you probably need to defer from the Kenneth Reagan's, you know, screening report to an in-depth analysis. So the sort scores, uh, you know, 40 is a grandmaster having a good day. 20 is a 2000 plus rated player having a good day. 10 is an average player having a good day. And I would just always look at anybody above zero. Okay, so this was a junior tournament. We've got players rated between 300 and, you know, 2200 kind of was the top player in this tournament. So there's a bunch of, you know, pretty strong players. And these are the players that I'm looking at here. Um, I've actually highlighted this for you. Those are the nine players that we eliminated from the tournament um, because of, of, uh, of, of fair play reasons. And you can see all of those had a sort score of above 10. Um, these ones who are plus 40, like this to me is, is, is pretty straightforward. They're not grandmasters, so it's almost impossible to score these sorts of scores unless you're a grandmaster, especially over the course of you know, 150 and 200 moves. Um, these players at 20s and 30s, we looked at their ratings and their ratings were significantly lower. So again, that became kind of obvious. And we, we approached all these nine players and we told them about it. We had some conversations. Five of those nine players, including the bottom two here, um, uh, you know, admitted to getting assistance in some or all of their games. So that was kind of validation that, you know, if the bottom two on our report have admitted it and five of the nine have admitted it, even if the top, if the top player, you know, the top player actually didn't, he, he, he or she um, completely, you know, said, no, I played fairly every single move, every single game. And that's fine. You know, they can defend themselves all they like. I, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, you know, spifflicate that person. We're not going to ban them for life. You know, it's just like, okay, you're not in this tournament. We welcome you back to some more tournaments. But when you come back, we're going to be watching you very closely. And funnily enough, his sort scores in future future tournaments, we're nowhere near this sort of 45 level, all right? So, um, you know, when you have those conversations with people, um, I think actually it, 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 can, it can actually, you know, change behaviours, which is what we're looking to do, okay? So five out of nine, uh, you know, were, were picked. Let me show you um, an online only tournament. Uh, so that, this, this juice tournament was online only, so this, that's fine. This was a corporate tournament that was also online, but this is a, a rapid tournament. These time control was uh, 10 minutes plus two seconds of move. And you would expect naturally at a faster time control, the scores are going to be lower. You're not going to be able to pick the best moves, uh, you know, the same as a computer as much uh, in a faster game. So you can see in this sort scores here and, you know, check out the ratings in this tournament. It's a much, much stronger tournament. You know, we've got players who are 22, 23, 2400. Um, so it's a much stronger tournament than the previous one. And yet the sort scores are much lower. We've only got a handful of people who are scoring above zero, 
we've got one person who's scoring above 10. And some of these are IMs and, 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 and GMs. So we've got you know, a, a really pretty strong tournament here um, and only one score above, above 10. So um, for me, this was great watching this event. I can say, oh, cool, we've got a sort score of, you know, that's kind of, you know, a, a long way ahead of everybody else. It's above, you know, it's above 10. Uh, like, I'm not too suspicious because, you know, this guy's an IM, like 23, 2381. Um, you know, if you've got a rating of 2300, and you're getting a score, sort score, like, this just tells you that you're above 2000. But, you know, we're going we're gonna to use this after three or four rounds to watch the last half of the tournament. And we're going to keep an eye on this player a lot more closely. So we can put that player on the screen. We can watch his game. We can watch his, his screen share. And I can see his eyes are completely focused on the board all the time. You know, he's, his, his mouse is on the screen. You know, all of the things that Eugenia talked about in terms of the, you know, the, the, you know, the clues that you can get. And those clues tell me, don't worry about this guy. Like he's doing, he, he's playing fairly. And that's all I want to know as, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to move, I want to move that out. So, um, you know, that's, that's the, uh, you know, that, that sort of said to me, okay, great. He's playing fairly. I don't have to look at him anymore. And I can focus my attention on some other players. And that's kind of really important. All right. So I'm now going to show you the same players. It's the same at corporate event, but instead of rapid, we're now playing a blitz tournament and just check out the sort scores and how they drop. All right, so now in a, rap, in a blitz tournament, we've only got two players, including IMs and GMs that are over, over, over zero. All right, so you know, the faster the time control, the, th these, are, these are not scaled to the rating. These are raw scores. So this doesn't comment whether you're a grandmaster or, an in, or, a, or, a, or a 200 or 300 beginner. It doesn't comment on what the time control is. It's just a raw score. So we give you that information and you will be able to judge, okay, I know this player. I know that, you know, if we, if we go to the junior tournament, we can say, I know this player. He's a rapidly improving 1800 rated player. Like I'm not too worried about a, you know, about a short score of six. Like this is, this is reasonable. I've, I've checked his, uh, you know, screen share. I've checked his camera. He seems to be doing the right thing. He's playing in an environment. Like you, you can talk about, you know, you can think about these other things and, and, and you know, get some, some additional evidence, right? Using this as an exclusive tool is, is not, very uh, is not very 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 helpful. Okay, the second and uh, what we call this gold standard uh, that you can use is a Kenneth Reagan's report. So this is what a Ken Reagan report looks like. Uh, it comes in as a text file. Usually you have to wait till the end of a tournament. You send that off to Ken. He's absolutely unbelievable human being. I don't know how he manages to do all the work that he's doing. Um, you know, in terms of uh, you know producing reports for for you know so many tournaments around the world um you know i would probably say to you don't send him everything because we don't want him to burn out uh you know so don't send him the local you know under nine schoolgirls tournament where you know all the fair play stats look pretty fair just for the sake of it right because yeah he, he is doing an absolutely mammoth workload uh in terms of supporting chess tournaments all around the world but if you do need need him uh he's amazing and you'll get a report that looks something like this Again, this is that same uh, European corporate championships, and it will show you, um, you know, kind of the three columns that are relevant. Uh, it's the percentage move match, and you can see that these percentages are kind of all over the place, but generally pretty low, well below the 60%. Uh, and, you know, this is because it's a, um, a, a rapid tournament, it's only 10-minute games, right? But you can get some people who get high scores, like 58, that's a pretty high percentage, but we're not going to worry too much about that. Um, we've got this column here is, is, is Kenneth Reagan's calls an average scale difference. This is still based on the centi pawn score. So this is um, 0.151 or 151 thousandths of a pawn. So this is in pawns, not in centi pawns. So you could call this 15.1 centi pawns. Um, and it is a scale difference. So it is not a raw score. As you, if you're on, if you're on a, uh, the way that it's calculated, if you're on an absolutely equal position with your opponent and you make a move which loses a pawn, that is worth the full 100 centi pawn loss. But if you're already a rook ahead, all right, it's a really uneven position and you make a move which loses a pawn, it will not give you the full 100 centi pawn loss. It will give you a, a, a scaled amount. All right, so what that does is that um, is that kind of brings everything in so that the it's it's more important when you make a really good move in a really good position, in a really even position. Right? It's not too worried when you're a rook up. So this scale difference, um, 
I would be I would not be concerned kind of about numbers that are below uh, 10 centipawns, 0.1. So I'm looking at numbers that are above 60% in this column, below 10 in this column, um, but be aware that you can tr you can get yourself uh, in trouble with that. So we picked one player in the in the in the juice tournament before we had you know a good understanding. He had a very very low scale difference. He had a very high move match for somebody who had a very low rating. You know, for this player, he's 2,400, so I'm, I'm, I'm not too concerned. But this player was like 1,300 and scoring these sorts of numbers. And so we actually eliminated him for cheating. And, and I, uh, my current belief is that we did, we did the wrong thing and that we, we picked him, as, and that was a false positive um, because we didn't trust the system well enough. And to trust the system, just look at this one number, this ROI. It's a raw outlier index. This ROI is essentially um, a, a percentile so it tells you where in the grand scheme of things this person sits, okay? And um, 50 is completely expected for your rating. So this is where they sit for their rating, okay? For their rating. So it is scaled to your rating. Everybody should be 50 if it was a perfectly average tournament. But of course, that's impossible. So a normal situation will be that you get a tournament with a range between 40 and 60 in an ROI. Between 40 and 60 is like a one in 50 occurrence. You know, you would expect, uh, in fact, it's probably even less than that. It's like a standard deviation of one. It's like, it's a, you know, one in one in seven, one in 10. Like it's, it's gonna be very common. In a tournament of 60 people like this, you're gonna be able to get somewhere between, you know, three or four people in this sort of high 50s, okay, so, and 60. So anything between 40 and 60 um, is probably an indication of fair play. If your entire tournament is between 40 and 60, like this one was, then that's great. That means your entire tournament is, is fair play, All right? We can look at a tournament like this though, where you get the entire tournament between 40 and 60, except for one player who's up at 71, All right? So once you're above 60, 60, and 60 to 70 is like, let's have a look at that. And maybe between 60 and 70, uh, you know, start thinking about, um, you know, are, is there some other evidence that might suggest that there's something going on? Because these players are playing well above what their rating would, 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 would expect, right? Um, and, it, and, you know, it might be that, you know, that there's somebody who, you know, has got this rating lag over COVID. Their rating hasn't changed since February, but you know that they're rapidly improving junior. They're probably 500 points higher rated now than they were then. And so you can kind of forgive a score in the you know, low and mid 60s, okay? A score of above 70 is, um, you know, and, and Ken Reagan will tell you, do not use this report as a determination of cheating. This is not evidence. This is just a screening report, as is the Tornello report. It's a screening report that tells you who to look at. And Ken Reagan actually then has a deeper analysis. Um, the deeper analysis then kind of goes into the actual individual moves and the type of position. And it's like, it's super sophisticated. It's 10 years worth of research and it, it, it's, um, you know, really reliable. It will end up giving you, uh, you know, a number that says there is a one in 3000 or a one in 300,000 chance that this player was playing fairly. This report doesn't give you that number. It doesn't tell you uh, there's a one in 300 chance this player was playing fairly. It just tells you where they are on the scale of things. And it tends to be that if you've got a move match of well over 60%, you've got this centi pawn loss that's really low, you know, kind of at, at stockfish levels, and you've got an ROI of above 70. The highest ROI I've seen in any tournaments that we've run is about 75. Um, but I know that there have been 80s and 80, you know, early 80s. Um, so a, 70, a 75 is like a sigma, like a three to four sigma result. So we're talking about, you know, uh, you know, kind of one in, you know, one in many thousands, uh, you know, kind of experience. So you should not be expecting to see a 71 in a tournament with 50 players. Like that's, that's very unusual, very unnatural. And so in this tournament, this player here, you know, with a 71, a 71 was eliminated for unfair play. Okay, that was pretty straightforward. Okay, so um, that's that's a, a quick insight into the Ken Reagan reports. I, I just want to quickly show you some of the things that we are doing in Tornello in terms of trying to visualize some of this data. And so here's an example of uh, of a of a of a club tournament. Um, it shows you players' ratings and it shows you where they fall. So when you see a green dot way out here past our sixty percent move match threshold you know, um, still that's the 20 centipawn loss threshold there. Um, you know, 
it, it's it's pretty suspicious. Why is there a green dot here when most of the green players kind of should be around about here? And so we'll be able to see visually. Ah, oh, yeah, this person uh, is, is 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 you know probably getting some assistance. And then when you look into the numbers a bit more, you're like, okay, great. And so we we were able to eliminate this player. We've got some players here which we might say, well, hang on, they're getting pretty close to the line. Let's keep an eye on those players. But also they're you know they're purple dots. So you know these are high rated players. So these are strong players. Maybe we're not going to be so concerned about them as if there was like a green dot all the way up here. All right, we've got some benchmarks. This is our favorite world champions here um, that, are, that are benchmarks that help us you know, show like, okay, these guys are still not playing world champion level. And, and this report kind of you know, is, a, is a good way of, of looking at those sorts of things. So um, you know, this is some of the work that we're doing, uh, working on those um, uh, you know, in, in the future as to what Tornello is gonna be coming out with. So um, th that kind of ends the, um, the, the sort of the, the, the presentation side of things. Um, I know we've gone a little bit over time, but I'm happy to throw it open to some, uh, some more questions. Uh, if people have got questions, please type them in the chat. We will uh, try and get to all your questions and identify and address anything that is, uh, as, as specifically uh, that you're asking. Um, so Wayne, you've asked the question about time. Any, any plans to use the time to make moves as a factor in fair play assessment? So the reports that I've showed you that both what Tornello does as a fair play risk screening or what Kenneth Reagan does in his fair play screening, those reports are um, only based on the moves of the game. It's a correlation analysis on the moves. I know that there are some platforms um, that will use additional type of information to, to make an assessment of fair play. So they will, for example, use the clock times. And there is a theory that if you're using a, a computer to get assistance, then you will be playing a more uh, rhythmic style of chess than a human who has a bit more variability. So a human will get stuck in a particular position and spend like a, an, an inconsistently large period of time on one move. Or there might be a really tricky situation. So you can go, well, this is a very complicated position. You know, they should be spending more time on that move. Um, and so there are platforms that are using that time information. You know, is the is the is this player playing like kind of in a, a metronomics, you know, step by step, like they're always playing a move every three seconds. Well, that might be an indication that they've got the computer set to think for three seconds and then they make their decision. So um, we're not using any of that, any of that information at the moment. We're only using correlation analysis on the actual moves itself, and we're feeding that information through to the arbiters. Uh, I know some some platforms will also try and spy on the computer resources and say, well, you know, are, are, are other programs running on the computer? Uh, you know, is the CPU being used at a, a kind of a, an unusually high rate? And, you know, um, computer chess engines are, are you know, are very uh, intensive, you know, uses of memory. So, you know, there are other things that can be done, um, you know, digital, digital, um, you know, digital analysis. We haven't got to any of that yet. Um, and I, I am a little bit hesitant to, to go into those, those sorts of things without uh, significant analysis. There is also the ability, obviously, if you're a, you know, a, a platform where people are playing on your platform over the long term, you can also do longer term analysis of players' style and performance uh, and, and um, you know, kind of use that in your determination. Uh, I will say that you know, in all of those situations, I think the arbiter should be the one who gets the information. I don't think it should be secret. Um, you know, when it's a, when it's a kind of a you know a, a, a cloak a cloaked experience, and you go, bang, you're out. I know the argument is like if you tell people what we're doing, then they're going to work out how to get around the rules. But can you imagine a society where the police said, well, we're not going to tell you what the rules are, but if you break them, we're going to chuck you in prison, right? Just kind of, it doesn't really promote uh, an environment of trust, does it? So I want to get the information out to the arbiters. That doesn't mean we have to make it public to everybody because we need to protect people's privacy, but the arbiters should be aware of the, the, the information and they should be making a decision based on that information so that the players, if the players trust the arbiter, then they trust the decisions, right? But when it's a, when it's a third party uh, you know, platform making a decision, based on statistics and, and analysis that is, you know, that is kind of, uh, you know, unknown, um, you know, then, then it, it starts getting, um, you know, you're, you're concerned then about false positives. You're concerned about, well, was this person eliminated for, you know, in, in effectively? 
So, um, you know, we're, we're pretty conservative in terms of all of the numbers that I've shared with you. Um, you know, the, the one false positive that, we, uh, that we're pretty sure we, we made a, a wrong decision, um, you know, was because we were basing it on Kenneth Reagan's, you know, not, not his ROI. His ROI was saying that, you know, it was below 60 and it's kind of safe, or it was, I think maybe it was low 60s, so it was kind of safe. So, um, you know, we, uh, ah, so, uh, yeah, so on, on the, um, uh, the juice on the Tornello fair play report, that person had a, a, a sort score of like minus 30 or something, you know, so we didn't have the Tornello fair play report at the time. And so we were relying on the, the, the move match. And we, we looked at, we were also making a mistake of looking at individual games and we looked at a few individual games and in some individual games, um, this player had extremely like 60, 70% move matches and, you know, extremely low sort scores. Um, but it was single game. You know, and a single game does not determine uh, whether whether there was whether there was um, whether there was whether there was unfair assistance. So I um, I I uh, you know I think I, I regret making that decision. I should have relied more on Ken Reagan's ROI score, which is a bit more sophisticated than than just those other numbers. And if we'd had the Tornello Fair Play report, it would have also told me that he wasn't in the top ten. So in that um, in in that uh, in that report that, uh, so I'll just, I'll just share this one again, back to the juice report. Uh, so in this, in this report here, our top nine players matched perfectly with the top nine with, 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 with Ken Reagan's report. So that tells us something like these top nine are the same as Ken Reagan's giving you on the top nine. These are the ones to be concerned about. After that, it started shuffling. And we had one player that was, you know, kind of high on Ken's report, but very, very low on ours. But again, you know, this, you know, once they're in, once they've got a sort score of, uh, you know, kind of below zero, um, you know, or they've got a Ken Reagan number, you know, in this ROI column of, you know, low 60s or, or below 60, you know, this is something that you shouldn't be concerned about. This is now kind of normal. Um, so, yeah, th those, are, those are some of the mistakes that we've made um, in, in, you know, unfortunately, picking, picking the wrong person and, and giving them a consequence that they probably didn't deserve. Um, Eugenia or Adam, did you see any other questions that um, that that we think need to to be addressed? Or um, if anyone else has any questions, please let us know quickly. Otherwise, we'll start wrapping things up. Um, so I will send out everybody a copy of the the, the recording from this uh, from this session, so you'll be able to review that at any time or share it with your friends and colleagues. Um, we'll also attach uh, Eugenia's, uh, you know great in detailed report about cheating and more focused on over the board, uh, you know, and over the board um, solutions. Um, and we'll share some other some other resources as well. Um, there is some information on uh, the Tornello help files as well. You can look into the fair play area there and it will give you all of this information. It gives you all of these statistics because we do want we do want the process to be public, even though we want the actual, um, you know, the actual data to, to remain private. So um, thank you very much, everybody, for your attendance. We really appreciate it. Um, please feel free to share this. And if you have any other questions or we'd like to talk more about, uh, you know, something in, in, in private, uh, I will also share in this meeting uh, chat. I'll share my calendar um, and you can also just book a, book a session with me and we'll spend half an hour or 45 minutes going into a little bit more detail in terms of, how the Tornello platform works. If you want to see more more details about that, um, or you know, talk about you know a bit more about the details of of any of these reports that you can read. So if you need some assistance, uh, I'm I'm absolutely uh, you know available all the time. Uh, just book yourself a meeting on my on my calendar, and we'd love to um, you know to have those conversations. So thanks again, everybody, and good night, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, Thank you, David. Thank you, Jarena. See you guys later on.